This is BBC News. We'll have the headlines and all the main news stories for you at the top of the hour, straight after this programme. Hello. No, don't adjust your set. This is the media show on the BBC. But that theme tune to News at 10 and the famous bongs are part of our popular culture. Along with the high angle sweep across London, over the rooftops, along the Thames to meet the face of Big Ben. All that is part of the iconography of British television news. But who watches the big network bulletins these days? More and more Gen Zers and millennials are increasingly moving online to get their news and information. Some older demographics, too, are attracted to more partisan, opinionated platforms. GB News, I'm looking at you. Even some politicians are openly disparaging of what they call the mainstream media. So how can ITV's News at 10 and Channel 4 News, with a soon-to-be departing Jon Snow, win audiences back? Is it a lost cause in this fractured multimedia age in which we live, or can trust be regained? Well, if anyone's got an idea, it had better be my next guest, Deborah Turness, the boss of ITN, overseeing news on ITV, Channel 4 and Channel 5, reaching around 10 million people a day, and on top of all that, having to deal with a financial black hole that would give anyone nightmares. Deborah Turness, welcome to The Media Show. It's good to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me to be on your show. Let's begin with a quick fire round. Where do you get your evening news? What do you watch? I watch, of course, the output of my own platforms uh, because that's, uh, of course, a critical part of my job and, and I always did anyway. So I watch ITV News. I watch News at 10, probably a bit more than evening news because I'm often still working for the evening news. I'll catch up on the ITV hub for that. I watch Channel 4 News. I watch Channel 5 News. I also look at BBC um, news at 10 as well. And the next day I will check in on the American bulletins as well, because it's just a habit of, uh, of the yeah. last decade I've had, and it's hard to uh, wean yourself away from it. You've got an impressive CV, the first woman editor of a network TV news show in the UK when you took the reins at ITV News. You then moved to America to head up NBC News and later become president of NBC, one of America's big three networks. What made you want to get into journalism in the first place? You know, when I was about 15, um, I started um, volunteering on a local newspaper site that was looking for a reporter in, in, in local schools to talk about what was going on in the school. It was the, um, the Hitchin and Stevenage Gazette. Um, and I started really enjoying it. And then I sort of went from there to do local music reviews of, of a, a local music venue that often attracted some quite good bands and realised that I could get some access uh, behind the scenes and, and start doing exciting things, uh, even at the age of kind of 16, 17. Um, and by the time I was at college, I, I started making plans um, to launch a, a student radio station, um, did some articles for the London student newspaper. Um, and it just grew from there, really. And then I was given the opportunity uh, for my year abroad, because I did part of my degree in French, to go and do a, um, a postgrad. Um, journalism uh, course at Bordeaux University uh, and I spent a year there uh, and I was completely smitten um, and I was completely focused on that as my career path and from there I was able to do my my stage my work experience not for the French media but I went to uh, to ITN uh, and worked for nothing in in the Paris bureau as then was uh, and that was my kind of side door way in to ITN. Yeah, you helped uh, John Snow, I understand, cover uh, a French presidential election. I did. You're very well informed. It was one of those uh, moments. It was a sliding door moment. Um, I was kind of working for nothing, sort of making the tea, et cetera. And then John Snow's producer um, fell ill and he needed somebody to go to the south of France. We were in Paris at the time to go and cover uh, Jacques Chirac's rally. It was the eve of the election and he was... The prime minister and he was standing to be president against Francois Mitterrand uh, and he just released the French hostages from Beirut that day he'd used his power as prime minister uh, to potentially persuade the French electorate to vote for him uh, these French hostages were national celebrities and had been incarcerated in Beirut for a very long time national news bulletins every night started with their faces and the number of days that they had been incarcerated um, 
And I went down to the south of France, met up with the crew. I was 21 at the time, 22, and um, managed to block a back corridor and get an exclusive interview with Jack Chirac in English that I fed back to Paris <laughs> and Jon Snow made it as lead story. And at that point, he, he, he pledged to support me and to help me get into uh, to ITN. And so he did. OK, so from blocking off corridors and getting exclusive interviews with French leading politicians, you worked your way up to become head of ITV News in 2004. How different was the ITV newsroom then, do you think, compared to now? That's a really great question. You know, I think what's wonderful about the ITV newsroom is that it continues to be a place of absolute commitment to um, finding out the truth, to digging up stories that others aren't digging up. Um, there's a real sense of family in that newsroom. Um, and I think if you just look at you know, Robert Moore's exclusive on, on the steps of the Capitol um, mm. in January this year, where you know, he was the only journalist in the world who was actually with those Capitol Hill rioters as they went into the Capitol building. And he told their story from the inside, mm. um, having invested a great deal of time, energy and good journalism in getting to know the movement, who they were, where they hung out, um, how they communicated in a way that even the American media had not. And I think that story alone tells us that the ITV newsroom of today um, still embodies um, those values um, of really agile, nimble journalism. You know, the greatest scoops come free because they're all about nous and knowing where the story is and following your gut instinct. And that's what Robert did. And that's what, you know, many, many journalists at ITV News continue to do today. And that's a, a rich, deep heritage, whether you're looking at, you know, Penny Marshall's exclusive at the Bosnian camps and, you know, many before her. Um, mm. That's what ITV News does at its best and continues to do. Mm. I mean, I, I'm proud to say that Robert Robert Moore is uh, is an old mate of mine, and uh, we've spoken to him here on the media show about that scoop. It was incredible journalism, um, and indeed, you've had several scoops yourself under your leadership, including the 2005 um, exclusive pictures of the capture of the 77 London bombers. I wonder how that story came to you, Deborah. Well, you know. The best scoops you get are the ones that really give you the element of surprise. And I remember that day so vividly. Um, so obviously we're in, in just after the 7-7, horrendous 7-7 attacks in London, where so many people lost their lives, that terrible terrorist attack, um, and everybody was on edge. And then, then came this, this, this news that... Um, there was a raid happening on these 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 this block of flats um, at the top of the Portobello Road in West London, and we dispatched our crews, um, and nobody knew what was going on because a TV complete news. cordon had been thrown around the area. But we were hearing all sorts of kind of sounds of stun grenades, and there was a, the helicopters, and there was obviously some kind of military action going on. Um, but nobody knew what on earth was going on. And then um, we got a call. Um, onto the news desk from somebody who actually lived in the flats and had literally a front on view of everything that was happening um, as the, the special forces came in and raided the flats and arrested the 21-7 terrorists who had plans um, to, to mount follow-up attacks. Um, and they had, this, this, this guy had recorded everything. Um, and I sort of said to him, I, I, I want the footage I, I need the footage. Please don't send it to anybody else. You know, he wanted he wanted money for it, um, and it had value. Um, and so we got into a negotiation, and then ABC, uh, the American uh, broadcasters, came in and just blew my offer to this guy for his footage um, out of the water. They put so much money on the table. Um, so I basically cold called the Daily Mail. Uh, and a guy who's since um, yeah. became uh, a good acquaintance, John Stiefel, and just said, I can't afford this. How can we do this together? Um, let's let's mount a, a joint bid. You can yeah. have the newspaper exclusive. I'll have the TV exclusive. Um, I think the tapes were thrown out of the back of the flat into a garden, and my producer had to climb over garden walls to go and get the tapes. Wow. And then 
And then we had to transfer them because they were on some weird format because it was the guy's home camera. And then James Mates, one of our amazing correspondents at ITV News, sat in an edit room with a lightning fast editor and turned around in time for the evening news. This unbelievable scoop. Nobody had a scrap of picture. Nobody had seen anything at this event that had been dominating every media platform in this country and around the world all day. And bang, evening news, headlines, exclusive. There it is. Mm. But you talked about Robert Moore a little bit earlier, saying that the best scoops are free. You actually paid for this one. How much did you pay? Well, they're not all free. And I won't talk about how much I paid. More more than I could afford, the thank you to the Daily Mail for coming in with us on six that Six figures. One. Six figures. I'm not even going to go there. I probably can't even remember, to be honest, Clive. It would have had to be six figures, wouldn't it, if you got um, the Daily Mail involved? No, 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 because you'd be surprised how low my budgets were. Um, right. No, no. I won't talk about the money here. It wouldn't, but, wouldn't but, be the uh, right thing. But it was. I have sure. to say, it was definitely worth it. And, um, okay. Very happy to have kept that scoop in the country. It would have been a shame to let it go to an American broadcaster. All right, OK. Well, you ran ITV News for just under a decade until 2013. And there is a school of thought, I think, Deborah, that that's the period, and I'm not laying all this at your door, absolutely not, but that's the period um, that the mainstream media probably lost touch with ordinary people, an estrangement um, that failed to predict the Brexit vote, ultimately. Um, or indeed Boris Johnson's 80-seat majority in 2019. It was probably a long time coming up to that decade. But do you think that's fair? Do you think that's when, you know, the, 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 the rubber did hit the road and, and many of the members of the public felt, you know what, I want my news el from elsewhere? Do you know, I think that ITV News is a news brand that has always been in touch with its audience and has been recognised uh, for that kind of connectivity. I think it comes up through its sort of rich regional routes through the ITV regional um, operation uh, with, with, you know, really considerable grassroots journalism um, across the country. And I think that does kind of feed up and into uh, the kind of news that ITV News is. Um, so I, while I do recognise that, 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 that overall um, the media lost touch with some members of the audience, I, I I think that impacted ITV News a little less than others. If I'm if I'm absolutely honest. Okay, um, let's talk about the states then. You leapt across the pond to America, uh, 2013 to run NBC News. Much bigger market, bigger budgets, bigger headaches. Frankly, um, for those tuning in who don't know their way around the American media landscape, um, where would you position NBC News in all that? NBC News is impartial. Politically, it doesn't have a point of view. And it's interesting because I know that you've, you've spoken about impartiality and the fairness doctrine in the US, and, and, and I'm with you uh, in terms of, um, you know, when Ronald Reagan did away with the fairness doctrine at the time mm. to, to make way for um, right-wing talk radio. Um, and this was the rule that meant that all broadcasters, if in order to have a licence in the United States, they had to give all points of view on a particular issue. Yeah. And once that was done away with, obviously, it changed the landscape um, and, and paved the way for Fox News and MSNBC and, and, and others, mm. um, which are you know, um, news entities with an approach and a point of view. Um, I would say that, that even though there isn't the kind of regulation we have in this country, um, NBC News um, invests very heavily um, to be impartial, to see all sides, um, and does it because that's a point of pride, because that's how they've how they've always done it, uh, and won't be lent upon and without fear or favour. Um, but that's tricky. But that's tricky, isn't it? In the age of Donald Trump, and in fact, your time at NBC coincided with the rise of of uh, the Donald, as it were. Yeah. Um, and that must have been a nightmare to comprehensively report on this man, whom the Washington Post reckons lied or made misleading statements more than. 30,000 times during his presidency. It was really hard. During the campaign, uh, as, as Donald Trump was becoming more of a force to be reckoned with, the challenge was not only um, how to not spend your entire programme fact-checking what he'd said, but an even greater danger, I felt, was how not to allow your programme to be consumed by the latest tweet, because... You know, there was news to, to carry. There were important issues to cover. And the circus, which is something which is you know, high octane in any normal American election cycle, um, was off the charts. 
But and on so, reflection, so to interrupt, on reflection, mm -hmm. do you think you should have called him out earlier? That coincided with your time when he was laying the foundation for this alternate reality of truth. Should you and others in America have called him out earlier? Look, I think his rhetoric became more complex and, if you like, darker as he went on. Um, did we call him out enough? You weren't the only it's, ones. It's hard for me to be the judge of that. But he was he was good for business as well, though, wasn't he? He was good for the bottom line. People tuned in. Look, I think that was something that really, you know, there are some famous quotes banding around uh, of other other um, network chiefs, not me. Uh, and I think it, it, it drove ratings for sure uh, on cable channels. Um, not necessarily on, on, on the platforms that I was driving. So I was, I was, you know, never in a position where I felt I was trying to exploit the, the Donald Trump phenomenon for, for, for ratings gain. Mm. Um, and we always tried to be balanced. But I will say, I, I think where, where, where we didn't get it right, uh, and we talked about it at length after the election, um, was, was to not only not to see him coming, but, 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 but to have listened to the electorate and to respect them. And I, and I think the problem is, Clive, that that, that that problem still prevails because if Robert Moore was the only correspondent uh, to be with the uh, rioters at the Capitol that day, it's because nobody else was listening. Nobody else was talking to those people, was visiting them in the towns where they live and where they come from to understand, um, which is why that story was missed. And I think it's the exact same set of circumstances. And so there's a sort of a lack of learning, if you like, um, several years on. A point well put. Uh, we're going to shuttle back over to the UK now. Um, you're the chief exec of ITN. You're ultimately the boss of ITV News, Channel 4 News, Channel 5 News. How much day-to-day -day journalism do you get involved with? Do you sign off controversial stories? I have to say, um, I'm almost not involved at all with journalism. Um, I'm, I'm up here, you know, on the fifth floor. I've got the Jeremy Vine team behind me, but other than that, I'm, I, you know, I'm running the business. I check in, there's, there's a morning editorial um, briefing mm -hmm. uh, at 10 o'clock to 10.15, where each of the news services talks about what they've got on that day, um, any legal issues, any safety issues, any comms issues. So you just let them get on with it? Yes, I really and do. Large. And you're saying that in a way as if you don't actually believe me. <laughs> you ask the editors, go and do your research, right. phone them all up, and they will say, we can't believe how hands-off she is editorially. We thought she was going to come in and be interventionist, and actually, she's not. OK. How much sharing of resources takes place? So, ITN... I mean, nobody, nobody in the world does what ITN does. Um, to run three incredibly distinctive news services... Um, and yet to do it with an economy of scale on so at the back end um, that makes it cost effective so that you can really focus enough of your you know, budget on covering the news, going to the place you need to go, investing in investigations. And um, so, yes, there's the building. There are, there's the sort of the massive engineering technical infrastructure of, of you know, master control studios and, and studio support, um, edit vehicles, satellite feeds, travel, all that stuff that happens that is completely non-competitive that just needs to be there. So the pipes and the support mechanisms, the IT and all of that. Um, but the newsrooms themselves are completely independent under separate editors, separate producers, separate news presenters. Uh, the teams in the field are separate. Of course, you know, when you're in the field, you'll help each other out. You'll, you know, you'll support each other as as colleagues. Um, but there, but there is an emphasis on keeping the final product as distinct as possible. One thousand percent, absolutely. Okay. And, that's and, and you know, and we and we are sort of, you know, we're we're brothers and sisters, but we're we're frenemies. You know, we we you know, we talk about a lot of what we're doing in front of each other, but we we hold back obviously the critical information about exclusives because it's competitive. So we we've and for many many years, you know, we've we've actually managed to walk that that tightrope and 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 it works it really really works yeah i mean how much of an overlap is there then with the audiences um so forgive me on this a crude summary might suggest that itv is for traditional viewers 
uh, perhaps older audiences. Channel 4 is for younger, left-leaning audiences, perhaps more social media savvy. Channel 5 viewers uh, are those people who are really waiting for the next pop history documentary to start. Well, that's quite stereotyping of the audiences, <laughs> I would say. Look, oh, I mean, Not too bad, not too bad. ITV News is, you know, m massive reach. Uh, I think second only to BBC nationally in terms of how many consumers it reaches, um, both in TV and digital, um, serving a, a, a broad agenda. Channel 4 News, um, yes, it goes more in depth. It has more investigations. Uh, it focuses on issues around social justice, um, and on you know, foreign affairs. So if, if that's your, your cup of tea, you're, you're going to go there. And Five News has really carved out a niche, but very much, you know, and almost like ahead of its time, a non-metropolitan view, um, serving a, a tea time audience who are going to be watching the you know, watching news initially at 5.30. Um, very, very sort of interested in um, you know, news scenes through the prism of ordinary people. Um, currently, they're running a really big... Um, series um, continually on long COVID and how that's impacting people out there, you know, doing more on that than anybody else. Um, so yeah, each, each has its own um, target audience, but I'm sure there are some people that watch, that watch all three. Yeah, but what's distinctive certainly about Channel 4 News, for instance, um, certainly as far as the government is concerned, is the sense that it's um, a little bit left wing. Why do you think they think that? Look, I think... Channel 4 News, it must be noted, um, has, has never once um, been found against by Ofcom in an impartiality ruling. Um, yeah, so, that's an important know, point to make. Very it's a really point important to point to make. Yeah. You know, the, 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 it covers news um, with impartiality. Is it robust? Yes. Um, is it uncompromising? Yes. So they ask sometimes the toughest questions? Yes, because that's what, what their brand is all about. And they have an hour to do it, which, as you know, in a, in a world of finite you know, um, news, news durations, you know, it's very hard to, to, when you have a half hour, to tell the, the, the world's story. You're always pressed for time. When you have an hour, you just have that, that extra beat to go deeper, to ask the second and third follow-up question. Um, but I think... You know, you're talking about you know, prioritization, I think, and 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 you know the the, the move currently um, is about economics. Um, it's about you know the longer term protection of Channel Four as the government as the government sees it. Um, and we, Are you confident we, that you can you can keep that independence with all the talk of privatization? Look, and we have to. Um, you know, we we are you know impartial ourselves on the model for Channel 4, but what we're not impartial about um, is Channel 4 News. Um, it, it is the most critical part of Channel 4's remit. Uh, it is the most recognised and, and awarded news programme in Britain. Um, it goes out there and does more um, world-changing, impactful journalism than any other you know, news programme there is. It reaches more young people on social platforms than any other news program. Um, it's incredibly important to the plurality of, of this country. It's a very important piece of our media landscape. And if Channel 4 is to be privatised, then we will um, fight for it to be protected. I, I, I have no reason to believe that the government won't protect it. In fact, I, you know, I do believe this government understands and recognises um, the importance of Channel 4 News. Is it sometimes a thorn in their side? Yes, it is. But I do think they, they recognise it. And I think our job is to make sure the journalism speaks for itself, that we continue to um, break exclusives um, and change the world. Um, and I think we even look to see if we can enhance the remit in a, in a, future, uh, in a future arrangement. I think there are models out there that point to how you can protect news. You know, I, I, was at, I was at Comcast when Comcast acquired Sky and Comcast have signed up to um, a 10-year guarantee of Sky News' budget, um, so you know, with RPI, and an independent editorial board which protects uh, Sky's uh, news at editorial independence. And I think there are, there are models there if we're serious about it. Um, so we're going to be obviously putting some of that into our... Um, our submission yeah. um, to the DCMS consultation. So how are you able, for instance, to deal with what The Telegraph reported last month to be ITN's £164.6 million pension deficit? How do you deal with that? 
Well, I mean, it's no secret that ITN has a has a pension deficit. Um, and in fact, the the Telegraph um, correspondent asked me about that and sort of said, you know, does it, does it trouble me um, that ultimately, you know, profit that we will generate will mostly go into sort of filling the, the pension deficit. And for me, I, I, I think it's a noble cause. Um, you know, people are motivated uh, for different reasons. I, I sort of said to him, you know, do people at The Guardian feel less motivated because it's a trust? So we must work very hard to make sure that the pension deficit um, is, 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 you know, the pension is kept alive. Finally, you've worked in mainstream TV news your whole career, and it is where most people get their news from, the television and programmes like News at 10 and the BBC News at 10 and Channel 4 News. Um, how long do you think that can remain the case, that most people get their news from television and not migrate online or elsewhere? I think the death of television news um, has been oft predicted, but it hasn't happened yet. And I think what needs to happen is that great brands, whether they are, whether it's, you know, the ITV News brand or individual programme brands like a Channel 4 News or a News at 10, um, will migrate with the audience and they will go where the audience goes and they must do that. And that's one of the things that I'm, I hopefully am here to, to make happen um, as we're seeing this accelerated migration. So I wouldn't like to predict the, the final demise of the appointment to view broadcast television news bulletin. Um, and the best of them will, will migrate in different formats, um, but with those brands and their brand values intact onto new platforms with their audiences. OK, Deborah Turness, thank you very much indeed for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clive. Thanks to Nigel Dix as well, today's sound engineer. The Media Show will be back same time next week. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.